Okay, welcome back. And here we have the schematic of the compass uh, control unit. And uh, what we see on the screen here, this is the schematic uh, for the board. And uh, let's just look at the power input first because it explains a lot about how the system was designed and how it actually represents your maths in real time. So the, there were four power connectors going in uh, on the board that we saw in the last video uh, where we had the four uh, connectors, red, black, red, black. Well, that's those connectors here. So we've got red, black, red, and black. You'll notice that the center two have been connected together to create a zero volts reference point, which is great. Therefore, um, this side here is our positive supply that produces plus 12 volts and the far end here, which uh, would be our negative uh, 12 volt supply. We have two protection diodes here that, that stops us if we happen to wire these up the wrong way around. Then in fact, it stops this being damaged. And so these diodes here are just to protect the uh, power supply. So we get positive 12 here and minus 12 here. Uh, these signals then go into standard 5 volt and minus 5 volt regulators. The 7805 is a positive volt regulator by plus 5 volts. And the 7905 is a negative 5 volt regulator. These capacitors uh, that surround these devices are as suggested by the manufacturer and they're just to stabilize the supply coming in and the supply coming out in order to make sure these regulators work uh, correctly. And then we have uh, an LED indicator to say that we actually have plus five volts here and we actually have minus five volts here. And those are the indicators that we saw on the box in the last video. And also uh, I have the ability to, uh, or have designed this to actually monitor the 12 volts. So I can actually, uh, these are signal conditioned before they go into the uh, microcontroller ADCs, but it allows me to actually monitor these signals to ensure that the voltage levels are going in and are correct. So that you as a user through the HMI can actually see that it is actually connected correctly and all is working well. So why have I created uh, a positive and negative supply? It's really important that you, when you see the maths that's going on behind your control system, you see it from a positive and negative perspective. It's no good me producing a signal uh, on the output of the oscilloscope and giving it a 1.25, for example, or some midpoint reference, because it just makes it confusing for you. It's easier for you to set the scope up when you connect it. If it's got zero volts, it means zero volts, and therefore there's zero error or zero signal. Whereas uh, if I now vary the signal positively, you will see it as a positive number. And if I vary it negatively, you'll see it as a negative number. But in order to achieve that, then it requires a bit of analog circuitry. So if I zoom out of here and pull this over, and this is what uh, all of this is for. So here, uh, just before I do that, we'll just uh, look at this microcontroller here. This is the PIC uh, 16F 1779, which my MEC 2200 students were very familiar with, who are also doing this experiment, ELEC 2540. Um, and there's a few things to say about this uh, whilst we're here. The first thing is that this is not using an external crystal oscillator. It uses the internal RC structure. Now that maybe was a bit of a mistake on my part, um, but I was trying to maximize the versatility of the outputs of this because I wanted access to all the output pins or the IO pins. Um, but with hindsight, it probably would have been better to have left it with a crystal oscillator connected to this point here, which would have made this very precise. So when you use an internal RC oscillator, um, they are tuned by the manufacturer to a degree, but they are not absolutely precise. And the frequency that I've set the internal RC oscillator to is to 16 uh, megahertz. Now, if that frequency isn't absolutely precise, then what will happen is that any timers that are generated, which are used for de developing all sorts of things, uh, won't be absolutely precise. And this does have an impact on the PWM that drives the servo. So if the 16 megahertz wasn't exactly 16 megahertz, say for example, it was uh, 16 point, um, I don't know, 16.1 or something, then that's quite a significant error. And it has an impact in the timers that then control the PWM. So it means the timers would be running faster than, uh, than you would expect. 
and therefore the time of pulses will be pulses might be smaller because you're running faster uh, and it has repercussions and so in order to get rid of this problem um, I actually during the um, uh, the starting phase of running the HMI one of the things I do is I calibrate the oscillator because inside this micro it's ability to tune the oscillator and it's got a register specifically associated with that. And so by adding numbers or subtracting numbers from that register, I can actually tune the oscillator to actually be as close to my 16 megahertz as possible, which means that then my system set up that all the time is inside will be as accurate as I can. And this is actually still fairly accurate, it's within 0.2%, uh, I believe, um, So, uh, which is certainly adequate for what we're doing. So, but we'll go into that when we discuss the HMI, but I just thought I'd mention it here. And also as embedded designers, it is important to understand that microcontrollers can be, have their crystal sources from many, um, many sources. And uh, so depending on what you do, you may choose not to have a crystal because you're trying to make your product cheaper. And in fact, time doesn't really matter. Whereas there are times when it needs to be absolutely precise, in which case you would actually use a crystal oscillator on the outside connected to pins such as this. Um, so just remember that when you're designing uh, with embedded systems and uh, a lot of you will be actually using bought in modules this is already thought about but as an engineer you need to become a little more broad than that and having this bit of awareness will uh, possibly help you in the future. So uh, let's go back to our analog circuit again. So I'm trying to create uh, here, uh, let's just look at one of the test point outputs that we discussed um, in the other video. So these are test point outputs, TP1, TP2, uh, TP3 and TP4. And these are what we're going to connect our oscilloscope to referenced to uh, the ground connection. So what we're trying to do is get a, um, a, a voltage out of here that comes from the DAC but is actually based around zero. Now the DAC actually uh, is a 10 bit DAC and so it has a range of zero to 1023 from a, a binary perspective, so it's uh, 10 bits, um, but it only goes in a positive direction, i.e. it goes from zero to whatever the reference is on the DAC from the DAC supply perspective. So the DAC uh, has been referenced from a precision reference, which is the REF03 here, which is a 2.5 volt precision reference. So that means that my signal coming in here on my DAC, this is just channel one here, DAC here goes from zero to 2.5 volts. But actually I want a signal here that actually will go between minus 1.25 and plus 1.25. So how do I do that? Well, to do that, we actually need to apply or, uh, or subtract a number from the DAC value. So that if I set the DAC to its midpoint, say for example, 512, uh, which is uh, plus 1.25 volts, at that value, I want to get zero out of here. So in order to achieve that, I need to get a reference, I need to subtract a value of 1.25 volts from it. So in order to do that, we use a summing circuit in the uh, inverting amplifier uh, circuit that we have here and you should know all about amplifiers by now so in order to do that we actually have our DAC input and we've got a subtracting or well, we're adding a negative voltage to this so where do I get that from so let's go back to our reference here's our reference here at 2.5 volts well, what I want to do is create a negative 1.25 volts i.e. minus half of the output from this well, this is easily achieved by this circuit. So let's just move that into the center of the screen. So here we have an inverting amplifier configuration and we've got a 20K resistor in and a feedback of 10K. And this means that we've got a, and just notice that really should say 10K, so I probably need to edit that. Um, so that's 20K and 10K, and therefore we got divide by two and it's also inverting. So we get negative 1.25 volts out of here. So we feed that into our summing amplifier here, so that if our DAC output is zero and we subtract 
um, minus 1.25 volts from it, we'll get uh, effectively uh, minus 1.25 volts here. Now, this, well, this, this amplifier is desperately trying to make these two points the same, and this point is fixed to zero. So uh, in terms of the feedback here, then what will happen is this is inverting. So we've got minus 1.25 volts here, that is zero. Therefore, this, it's got a unity gain, and therefore this will produce plus 1.25 volts at this point. Remember, it's inverting, and this is zero. And if that is uh, minus 1.25 volts, this has to become plus 1.25 volts in order to make that point here zero. As you well know from op amp, the op amp is desperately trying to make these two points the same value. So at a zero value of DAC, we end up with plus 1.25 volts here. And then if the DAC goes to um, its midpoint position 512, which is approximately 1.25 volts, we end up with 1.25 volts here and minus 1.25 volts here, which is a constant. That means that um, this is already zero and therefore this amplifier actually now generates a zero voltage here because it doesn't have to get this point to zero because it already is. So we now get zero out of here when this DAC value is set to 512 approximately. Now then on the other case, let's raise this DAC output to its maximum. So it's at, uh, from a binary perspective, we're actually um, setting all the bits to one. So that's the equivalent of 1023 because it's a 10 bit DAC. And now what happens is uh, we've got um, 2.5 volts here, minus 1.25 means the voltage that's actually effectively at this output here is going to be inverted. So it's going to be minus 1.25 volts in order to get this point to be zero. So, um, and so therefore we've got uh, minus 1.25 volts here. The reason for the resistor here is actually just to protect this output so that if this is shorted out, it doesn't damage the amplifier here. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, so what we're going to do in the maths time is we're loading the DAC with particular values and we know the midpoint uh, for zero volts out is 512. So all our DACs at initialization in the software will be set to 512 in order to create a zero volts output here. And that's what you'll see in your oscilloscope. As this goes positive, then this output goes negative. And as this, uh, so is, is this, so as this goes towards um, uh, plus 2.5 volts, this will go to minus um, uh, 1.25 volts. And as this goes to zero, this will go to plus 1.25 volts. And that's what you're gonna see on your oscilloscope. And that allows us to see the maths in real time. So the four circuits are identical for each of the channel outputs. So we've got uh, channel one, channel two, channel three and channel four. And uh, that's actually what uh, provides our uh, real-time maths uh, when we actually monitor on the scope. Uh, there's a great deal else to say about uh, this. Uh, these are, just for uh, interest point, these are the uh, negative monitors. I've got an inverting amplifier here, so it takes the negative signal, turns into positive signal, which goes into my analog input on my microcontroller, and I therefore can actually calculate what the voltage is uh, coming in uh, to the system from a negative perspective. And similarly, there's the positive monitor, which does the same thing, but it's already positive anyway, so we don't need to invert it. So that's just buffering the signal to go into uh, a different uh, analog input on the channel. And uh, let's see, anything else on here? Uh, there's our trigger output, which we'll discuss in more detail when we look at the software. Um, but that allows us to do all sorts of things. The trigger output could be used to generate signals uh, that we can monitor on an oscilloscope and would also be used to trigger the oscilloscope uh, when we're actually running our algorithms. So we have a known starting point. Uh, so that's what uh, this circuit here is doing. And uh, the communications for the HMI is coming through uh, here. So there we are coming through here to the receive and transmit of the microcontroller with a common reference to ground. So our system has got a common ground throughout the whole, uh, uh, the whole structure. And other than that, I think that's about it. So 
Uh, we're now uh, going to uh, stop this video and we're going to then look at this, have an introduction to the software so you get an idea of how, actually how the HMI works and uh, also looking at the calibration and other features that we're actually going to use when we actually run the actual lab experiment.